Last week, we looked at the story of the prodigal son and focused on how our heavenly father loves us, saying it's how the father loved the son who returned to him in the story. And we said one thing about God's love is that when God loves us, God holds nothing back. God gives us his best. At the end of the story, we know the father threw a big banquet for his son, holding nothing back. God is the same way. When, when God wants to love us, I had mentioned that he just doesn't have a calf, but remember they, they, they killed the fatted calf. And God gives the best robe, and he gives, you know, everlasting joy and peace that passes all understanding. God does not give his love to us and for us uh, sparingly, but extravagantly, lavishly. God holds nothing back. And we said the clearest place where we see that is in the cross. It is on the cross where God gave his one and only son for us. Remember in the story, the father extended his arms to the son. And we said that God extended his arms for us when Jesus went on to that cross. And that is where God loves us and forgives us and cares for us and comforts us. That's where God has given us his best, holding nothing back. And it's essential for us to have a clear understanding of that and a full appreciation of how God has loved us in Jesus Christ because That is the foundation from which we work from, as then we go out into the world to live and to love and to care for other people. Jesus says to us, look, I'm going to give you a new commandment. Love other people the way that I have loved you. This is how people will know that you are my disciples, that you'll have love for each other. Throughout the Bible, we are told that followers of God are a people who will love. We love because we've first been loved. We will forgive because we have been forgiven. We will love God with all of our heart. And then we will love our neighbor as ourself. Today in our gospel lesson, I believe it's about love. It's about Mary's love that she expresses. And I want to talk about that this morning, but specifically about when, when Mary loves And our text for today, it began by saying it was six days before Passover. It was coming near to the end for Jesus. Jesus shows just an amazing amount of courage as he still goes towards Jerusalem. He knows that the political and religious figures have branded him as an outlaw. He knows that the religious leaders especially were plotting to kill him. He knew that that awaited for him in Jerusalem, but he still goes. We're told it's the time of Passover. This was a time when Jews from all over the known world converged upon that tiny city of Jerusalem. Passover was a time when the Jews remembered when God had freed them from their slavery in Egypt. So they would come and they would gather and they would remember how God had loved them in the past, how this God of power still worked and would love them in their lives. And the crowds were so large. The historian Josephus tells us that the average amount of lambs that were sacrificed during Passover in the temple were about 2,600 lambs in regards to 260,000 rather lambs. And it took at least 10 men to make a valid Passover for each lamb. So then you add the women and children onto that. And people say about 2.7 million gathered in Jerusalem for Passover at this time. Well, the city couldn't fit them all. So many people would gather in towns that were near Jerusalem. One of those towns was Bethany. That's where Jesus is. The law permitted for people to go to those towns to celebrate Passover there, and it would count for them being within the city of Jerusalem. So Jesus is in Bethany. He's in a very familiar place. He had been to the home of Lazarus and Martha and Mary a number of times. He was close with them. We're told in the Bible, this is the Lazarus that Jesus loved very much. The Lazarus that he wept for when when Lazarus died. The Lazarus that he raised back to life after being dead four days in the tomb. Mary and Martha witnessed this resurrection. Now, Martha was someone who, who truly... Uh, the scriptures say, was serving Jesus. And that's where she truly felt comfortable. 
Remember another story earlier in the gospel where Jesus had visited their house and Mary with some others, they were at the feet of Jesus listening to his teaching. Well, Martha, though, she couldn't listen. She was all worried about making sure the preparations were correct for the dinner that they were going to eat. So Martha comes to Jesus and says, look, would you please tell Mary to get up and come and help me? And Jesus says, look, Martha, calm down. Look, you're worried about many things, but please know that it is Mary who has found the thing, the most important thing that will last. So Jesus wasn't saying it wasn't important to get ready for dinner. But what he was saying is, look, sometimes we can get so busy doing things for Jesus that we forget to spend time with Jesus. He was calling Martha back to that. So we find Martha, again, in in the same position of comfortable being serving. She expressed her love to Jesus by using the ability of her hands and by working. How many people down through the ages have served Jesus faithfully by sharing their abilities, by using their hands, loving God in that way? But then we have Mary. Mary, again, this time today in our gospel, finds herself in a familiar position. She's at the feet of Jesus again. And it is there that she anoints Jesus' feet with an expensive ointment. You see, Mary's heart overflows for love for Jesus as well. And in her action, we will see her take the most precious thing that she possesses, and she will give it for Jesus. We're told that she has this perfume. It's, it's lard. Scholars believe it's a, a lard, a perfume that came from the mountains of India. Very expensive. It was worth a year's wage. I mean, think about that. Think about what you make in a year and you would gather that together and in one moment you would be compelled out of love to give it to Jesus. That's what's happening here. And so as Mary loves Jesus in that way, she gives what's most important to her. Now, scholar William Barclay says this about that type of love. He says, love is not love if it nicely calculates what it's going to cost. Love gives its all and its only regret is that it has not more to give. I don't know if you've ever heard of the story, The Gift of the Magi. It's a a neat story. It's about a young American couple who who are married and their names are Della and Jim. And they're very poor, but they're also very much in love. And Christmas is coming. And they really don't have money to buy each other a present. But there is something that both of them treasure very much, something that's really important to them, something that that they hold up very high in their life. For for Della, the thing that she really treasures is she has the most beautiful, long black hair. It goes all the way down, you know, past her waist. And when she lets her hair out, it even looks almost like a robe behind her. And her husband, Jim, he has an extravagant gold pocket watch that was given to him by his grandfather, and that's his pride and his joy. Well, it's the day before Christmas, and all Della has is a dollar and 87 cents to buy Jim a gift. Well, she goes out to a wig maker, and what she does is she allows the wig maker to cut her hair very short. She sells her hair to get enough money to buy a very nice chain for Jim's pocket watch. Well, that night, Jim comes home and he looks at Della and he's just shocked. Her hair is so short. And it's not that he didn't, you know, still love her the same. And it's not that he didn't like it. She was lovelier than ever. But then he slowly handed and gave her his gift. And his gift was an expensive comb and brush set that she was to use, he wanted to, what, comb and brush her long, beautiful hair. What did they both do? Well, to buy those brushes, he had sold his, what, his gold pocket watch to do it. Both of them, both of them were willing to sacrifice the one thing that they prized the most, but they were willing to do it for the other. You see, that's the love Mary's showing to Jesus that type of love. But Judas doesn't like it too much. Judas says, what in the world are you doing? We could have used this to help the poor. It's a year's wages. But Jesus knows what's in his heart. 
I mean, you and I might be able to fool other people by what they see on the outside, but just like with Judas, God knows what's going on in our heart, right? And he says, look, Judas, you know, don't get so upset about it. Yeah, you, you say you could have used this money for the poor. The poor are always gonna be with us, right? But she needed to do this in this moment for me. Judas was someone who like, you know, every once in a while he would, it says, go into the money bag and take a little bit for himself. Sometimes I'll pop my head back in the back where the money counters are after church. I'm not gonna tell you where they are, all right? But they're back there. And I'll pop my head and I'll say, now remember the rule, all right? Two for the church and one for the senior pastor. That's how you separate the money, okay? And they never have listened to me yet. But, but that's what Judas was doing. But you know, when it comes to Mary, Jesus is saying, look, it doesn't mean you ignore the poor. It doesn't mean that the poor shouldn't be high on your priority list. But on this specific occasion, Mary did what she needed to do. Why? Because she knew if she did not express her love to Jesus in that moment, in that way, that she might not have another chance to do so. That ointment was normally used to prepare someone's body after they had died for burial. But she could not wait. She needed to express her love in that moment for Jesus while he was still with her. She could not wait to love to later. She had to love in the now. And she wasn't sure. There were no guarantees that she could do this for Jesus next weekend. There was no certainty that Jesus would be in her home again, just like this. And there was no promise that she could recapture this moment. And I think you and I can understand that. There are some things we will never do, never do unless we take hold of the opportunity and seize the moment when it is right before us. And if we don't, it will be lost. So she anoints Jesus' feet. Normally, when you anoint someone, you anoint them from their head down. Remember the 23rd Psalm? He anointeth my head with oil and my cup overflows. But Mary doesn't feel like she is even worthy to, to give Jesus an honor. So she approaches him the only way that she knows how, and that's on bended knee, humbly before him, and she anoints his feet, foreshadowing his death. And again, proclaiming what she had said when her brother was raised from the dead, that she believed him to be the Lord and the Messiah. I think Mary reveals one major truth for life. When you have a chance to express your love today, don't put it off until tomorrow. How often do we have a chance to do something helpful, to do something generous, something big-hearted, something thoughtful, something meaningful through an action of ours, whether it's a big action or a small one, and we fail to do it because we kind of put it off. We'll do it later, or we'll do it tomorrow, or we'll do it next week, we say, or we'll do it the next time that we see that person believing that we'll always have another chance. There's a fable about three devils who were on an apprenticeship. They were on their process of becoming you know, full devils. And they had one last trip to earth uh, to try to pull as many people away from God as they could before they could kind of graduate. So they go to the head devil, which we know is Satan. And Satan says, how in the world are you going to pull people away from God? What are you going to do when you go on earth? And the first devil says, well, I will tell people that there is no God. And Satan says, that's not really going to deter people because people, you know, know that there's a God. The second one says, well, I will tell them that there is no hell. Satan says, that's not going to work because people know that there is a hell because of their sin. And so the third devil says, I will tell them that there is no hurry at all. Satan says, go. You will run them by the millions. That's really important when it comes to our following of Jesus Christ. If we're right with him, we cannot put off to tomorrow getting right with God in our today. But we also should not put off to tomorrow doing what is right in love for others. I came across a quote this week that says, God has promised forgiveness for our repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow for our procrastination. Let me tell you a story about a former Speaker of the House in our government, Sam Rayburn. You may not recognize the name. 
He lived in the first half of the 20th century, died in the 1960s. Most famously known for being the Speaker of the House for the longest term ever, for 17 years in our government. But one evening, Sam Rayburn, the Speaker, heard about a good friend of his whose um, teenage daughter suddenly passed away in the evening. So that next morning, Speaker Rayburn went to that man's house, knocked on the door. The father came to the door, and he said, I I just stopped in to see if there's anything that I can do to help out. And the father of the girl who passed away said, Speaker Rayburn, there, there really isn't. We're just trying to make final arrangements. And Mr. Rayburn then said, well, have you, have you had your coffee this morning? Have you had breakfast? And he said, no, we haven't even had time to think about that. And he said, well, at least let me come in and get your coffee started and a little breakfast. So the speaker, Speaker Rayburn, went into the kitchen, started the coffee, started making breakfast. And then the father of the daughter walked into the kitchen and he said, Speaker Rayburn, I thought that you were supposed to have breakfast this morning at the White House with the president. And Mr. Rayburn said, well, I was. But I called the president and I told him I had a friend who was in trouble and that I couldn't come to be with him today. And you see, that morning and in that moment, it could have passed and Senator Rayburn could have gone on without going to his friend's home. And he could have for the next two or three days been saying, oh, I got to stop by and see my friend. Uh, I I need to contact him. Oh, I need to tell him how much I'm thinking about him. I need to go by and support him. I need to. I should have, I would have, and I could have. But instead, instead of tomorrow, he took the opportunity today. He changed his plans, and he expressed his love in the moment, now instead of later. I mean, how many times do we say that we're going to call someone that we're going to send them a text, that we're going to send them an email, that we're going to get in touch with them and then go out to lunch with them. Someone who's lost a loved one, someone who has been struggling in a relationship, someone who's recovering from surgery or, or going through treatment, someone who's starting to step away from the Lord. How many times do we mean to tell someone happy birthday on their actual birthday? or happy anniversary on their actual anniversary, or congratulations to someone for important accomplishments in their life. How many times have we put off helping a neighbor or a family member with a project that we've told them that we would help them with, or taking a day trip to a place in Pennsylvania or DC with someone that we tell them we're going to do, or maybe even finally taking the time to teach our our child how to swing a bat or how, hit, how to hit a tennis ball? How many times did we fail to say I love you to our spouse when we leave the house in the morning? Fail to say how proud we are of our teenager telling ourselves, well, we'll get another chance. Ah, my son, my daughter, they, they, they know how I feel. How many times did we hold back from telling a friend how much we appreciate them? You see, there's a time for saying and there's a time for doing. And when that moment passes, we might not have a chance again to say and to do. As a pastor, I can't tell you how many times I've been with families who have lost a loved one to death unexpectedly. And when I've sat down with them, they have said to me, Pastor Paul, if I I would have only known that that was the last time that I would have seen them or the last time that I had a chance to talk with them, I would have done things differently. And because of that, because of not loving in the moment, maybe just taking it for granted, then they've had to deal with, what, a little bit of regret and work through a little bit of remorse. You know, probably because I'm going through this sermon this week, preparing it, I've been really busy the last few weeks, and you all know the story about my mom, and she's working through Alzheimer's, and she's now home, um, and she's going to a day facility for people who have her challenge and takes a bus there and then comes home at night. She's able to be at home at night with my dad and on weekends with the family. And I hadn't been able to get down past the Bay Bridge for about three weeks to see her. And so I I just had to do it. I'm working on this sermon, was tugging at my heart. And so Thursday, I was visiting with someone in their home. And after I finished praying with them, it was about 2.30, I just shot in my car down to past the Bay Bridge to Kent Narrows Picked her up at four o'clock when she got off her bus, took her back to the house, spent about an hour and a half with mom. 
Dad came in and then the three of us went out to dinner, had a great time. Uh, they paid for it, so that was good. Um, <laughs> and then we came back, you know, to, to their house and I stayed in a couple more hours and got home about nine o'clock or, or so. And I don't want to know any other way to say it to you, but it was just time to what? To love in the moment and to stop putting it off till tomorrow. And I think that's so important. It's so important. And I really, that we have, I think as, as Christians, we too have to guard from falling into the mode in our lives. That's called the tomorrow mode. You know, I'll have a chance to talk to someone tomorrow or I'll work out a disagreement tomorrow or I'll tell someone how I feel about them tomorrow or I'll spend time with someone tomorrow. You know, last night, two people came up to me and said, hey, you got something on your nose there. You gotta wipe it off. And I do have something on my nose, but you can't wipe it off. I, uh, three weeks ago when I was in Texas for a few days, my wife said, hey, you got something on your nose there. And as I looked at it, it's, it's definitely a bump. It's a little growth. So I went to the dermatologist when I came home and he gave me a, a ointment for it. But as a week went by, it didn't change. So I went back on Friday and he said, well, we better, better cut some of that out and send it away and, and really get a testing on it. Well, you know, I've been through cancer and worked through that in my own life. And the smallest thing, if you get a little bump or you get a growth and anytime the doctor says, oh, we better send it away to see what it is, now you get little butterflies. Now look, you give it all to the Lord and you give it over to his will and you trust that, but it does when you come home again, it makes you stop and it makes you think, maybe I need to you know, hug my spouse a little bit longer. You know, maybe I need to talk to my son in college a, a little bit more. Maybe I need to spend time with my other son at home just a little bit more focused. Because whether it's you or me, None of us have tomorrow promised to us. None of us. And there is no guarantee that's given to any of us. We are called to love. And we're called not just to love the way God wants us to, but hopefully we can love what? In the moment. Whenever we have an opportunity with people who are before us. Mary took that expensive ointment and, and anointed Jesus' feet. She was not gonna wait till after he passed away. I pray that we will seize the moments of our lives as well. That we will seize them as well. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and we're very grateful for your love that you've shown to us. And we pray, Lord, that you will lead us in a very fruitful way to share that love with others. Help us to seize the moment. Help us to be very intentional, to be focused. Help us to say the things and to do the things that are meaningful, that are important, uh, so that we can really live life with each other the way we know you intend us to do. And in your precious name we pray, amen. There's a Where mercy reigns and never dies There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide
wake up the light comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I need all of you I need all of you where you love red red let my sin wash white I owe all of you I owe all of you hear my hope here my hope is found here on holy Yo